Hello and we continue today our session on Satriya. Today we will look at the issue of creativity within Satriya. As you may recall, the Satras were born out of the Bhakti movement as it came to Assam. Like the Bhakti movement in different parts of India, the Bhakti movement in Assam, which was called the Ekasaran Namadharam, had a creative audiovisual aspect as well. This audiovisual aspect was used for its propagation and as part of its rituals. Through its creative genius, Shankadev was able to mold not just the religious life of the people but the spiritual and cultural life of the people. The epicenter of the cultural life and religious life was the Satra. The Satra was an institution that was created five centuries ago and became the center of cultural tradition. The earliest religious performances associated with Sriman Shankadev were the staging of a bhavana called Sinayatra. It was done in his father's home in Bardova, which incidentally was the same house where he was born. The Bardova Charita and the Kathaguru Charita, which are both uh, commentaries, texts that record the history, uh, tell us that the sh in a vivid description how the Sinayatra went. It was a scene of seven Vaikuntas painted on a tulapath and Sriman Shankadev was part of the performance in which a Vishnu presided over each. Shankadev himself participated in more than one role. It was staged on a raised platform against this painted background. Uh, he trained dancers called Natuas, singers and musicians called Gayans and Bayans. They prepared mukhas, which are masks, and accessories called chores, and made all necessary arrangements for the success of this dramatic spectacle. The preparation included getting the potters of Kapilimuk and the cobblers of Salmara make the mridangs, from which the present day coals that are used by Satriya today were eventually born. Several varieties of symbols like the manjira, the kutital and the big bortal were made to his specifications. They say that illuminations and fireworks were part of this presentation. Unfortunately, no other reference, either pictorial or literary, exists about the staging of Sinha Yatra other than what is contained in these texts. The arts of the Satras were ever fired by creativity. Within the world of Ankhya Bhavana, we get a glimpse of the saint poet's aesthetic vision, set in the context of the classical theatre, local life, colours of ethnicity, with the joyous expressions of his faith and experiences. The Ankhya Bhavana, based on the Ankhya Nats, written by Shankadev, heralded a new and complete language of theatre. It did not break away from previous theatrical and performance traditions, but was itself a dexterous and creative combination of poetry, multilingual skills, music, dance and drama. Ankhya Nats were the first regional form of theatre which marked the second flowering of theatre in India. It kept some elements from the classical form of theatre, often dressing them differently. For instance, as a Purvarang, it introduced the attractive Gayan Bayan by itself and aesthetically mounted dance and song choreography. Then in the Prarochana segment, the Sutradhar introduces the subject matter both in Sanskrit and in the vernacular. It changed its lingual oral scope to include the vernacular Assamese and the fantastical Brajavali. Brajavali also employed elements of Hindi, Assamese, Maithili and Brajbhasha which Shankadev deliberately used in the Ankhya Nats and even retained in the Satra's lingual traditions a smattering of Sanskrit. He set the standards and the template for future writings by the next generations. His principal disciple Madhavdev wrote a series of plays called Jhumuras. 
Because there is a tradition in many sutras of the Satra Dhikar as part of his official duties to create a new bhavana, many new works got added to the scribal wealth of the sutras over the centuries. Thus, the sutras came to be centers for scribal excellence and the birthplace of two new languages, Assamese and Brajavali. It was a master stroke of creative genius that while one helped link the various ethnicities in Assam, the other, namely Brajavali, helped link Assam to the rest of India. As early as in the Sinayatra days, Shankadev used masks. The tradition of mask is very rich in the sutras, but regrettably is dwindling because the Khanikars are fast disappearing. Even though the most fantastical characters in the Bhavanas all wear masks. The mask is simultaneously an object of concealing as it is an object of revealing. Some of the putis or old texts found in the sutras refer to mukhas and chos as two types of masks. Interestingly, the green room or the room for storing properties for a bhavana in a sutra is called Joghar. However, it would probably be better to describe the kinds of masks available in the sutras as mukha, mukha, which covers the face and maybe the neck, the latukai mukha, or one that covers most of the body, and the bor mukha, which as its name suggests, hides the entire body, often more than one bodies. These masks have to be made with adequate joints to allow movements. The masks are made with natural material, including cane, clay, roots, coconuts, jute fibers, cloth, and paint. They have to have the right features and the appropriate expression. This is a remarkable example of creativity that is not standardized and has to be created afresh each time. Today, the Satras of Samaguri in Majuli, the Katpar Satra in Sibsagar, and the Bogiai Elengi Satra in Titabor near Jorhat continue this practice of mask making. In the 17th century itself, the Barpeta Satras Mathura Das Bura Bhagat recognized the ritual calendar of the sutras, including the variations in the congregational services and the distribution of the canonical texts of Madhadev and Shankaradev and all other attas in such a manner that they all found representation in the ceremonies of the sutras. For instance, Dance and music elements from the bhavanas as well as salis um, were made part of the sacred calendar. Salis are part of the occasional services associated with Madhavdev, their creator. But when the request for the sali to be danced in the court came about, the sacredness of the original salis could not be diluted. And as such, a new set of four Rajakariya salis came into existence with the express purpose of being performed in court. This sort of grouping served as a template for subsequent centuries. As a result of this ordering, dance, music and theatre became a strong and vibrant tradition in the sutras in and around Barpeta, especially amongst the Nika Samhati sutras. The Kamlabari sutras set forth a new discipline of pedagogy and evolved a methodology by which these arts were pursued by the celibate Bhagat, who lived in the sutras. With far fewer distractions than family-based sutras, the celibate sutras could dedicate themselves more completely to the pursuit of creative excellence. The Kamlabari sutras were instrumental in enlarging the Satriya dance space, not only in terms of numeric strength, but also by way of stylizing and individualizing key dance items. They played differently for males and females. They added a flourish of rhythms here and there, and they played musically rather than by beat and count the percussion instruments of the sutras. This introduced just that amount of unpredictability, 
which enhanced excitement and simply made the piece glow from within. For instance, there is a rag tal link that is dependent on the prayog and expertise of the practitioner. Experts are known to weave in many patterns of rhythm so deftly and so subtly that they do not distract from the agenda which is evoking the spirit of bhakti. The music in the sutras know 42 tals but commonly employ 29 talas. All these tals are played in a creative manner. Sometimes the same tal is played in different sutras in a different manner. For instance, the thak tal of the Bali Sutra and the thak tal of the Samaguri Sutra are different. In a dance example, it must be said that though the bhavanas did not need the pure dance segments, they introduced brilliant portions that serve to embellish the narrative or allow for a breather in between dramatic moments. In the dances of the sutras, all four abhinays are used and yet there is a complaint that abhinay segment is weak in satriya since in the performance in the sutras they were addressing those who were already familiar with it. The four vrittis are employed including the kaisaki vritti although they were enacted by males. However, undoubtedly the bhavanas are biased towards the extended use of the bharati vritti. A clutch of 44 nritya hearts. In the Sutra tradition, they are called hearts and not hastas. And 32 nritya hat to embellish the movements and the abhinay with are employed. The abhinay was both shabdarthak and padarthak. The vinyog is nuanced with certain gestures suggesting specific things. It also has a special category of hands that suggests the Dashavatar, the Devas, the Nakshatras and the Sambandhas or relationships. All this provides much scope for experimenting with new choreographies and fresh creations. They do it all while staying within the parameters of tradition. Thus the Kirtan Ghar within the Sutra as the center for congregational prayers and practice served as the nursery for creativity. But it is equally true that the spaces outside the sutras are often very vibrant spaces for creativity to burgeon forth. Many are convinced that Jatin Goswami and Anand Mohan Bhagwati's choreographies came forth so effortlessly and made such a strong impact because of the experience that they had had with the challenges of the Department of Information and PR where they were expected to experiment with traditional dances in such a manner that they could be used as vehicles to carry forward the messages that the government wanted to send down the line. Today, Goswami's son Gunakar is doing some remarkable creative and internationally acknowledged work with Ojhapali and Ankiya Bhavna. Not only did the Ekasaran Nam Dharam faith challenge caste divides, it reinforced the message in many ways. The fact that the bhavana up happens with people seated all around it, with no deference to high and low, was a big change. Further, given the fact that the play occurred amongst the audiences, composed of many castes, classes and ethnicities, with all the characters right there beside them, was a big advance in reinforcing the inclusive and egalitarian profile of the faith. The democratic participation itself was a perfect example of the pronounced social revolution questioning some of the dogmatic discourses of the society. References to the equal status and rights to all sections of the people in the texts of the saints aptly declares the significant revolutionary note of social change that the sutras were introducing. Since the stage space was narrow and often crowded, imaginative cues were given to make a change of scene. Much had to be done by the imagination of the audience as well. A deft twirl was often enough to suggest the change scene. Sometimes two scenes would play out at the same time in this oblong corridor. The Sutradhar would explain how one of the scenes complements the other. So imagine you are watching these two scenes and you are understanding how one part of the scene impacts the other.
The interactive and the continuous role of the Sutradhar was built keeping a neo-literate audience in mind. It was his job to make sure that they did not miss the message and they did not forget that they were here not for mere entertainment but for a sacred bhakti oriented experience. Thus the role of the Sutradhar is critical. The underpinning of bhakti was writ across the performance in many ways. If you get a chance to see it, I would like you to keep your minds open for these little clues. Now, for instance, the characters emerge from under a nine lamp gateway, which was called the Agnigar. It suggested the Navda Bhakti or the nine modes of Bhakti. Then again, there is a tradition during an Ankhya Bhavana of carrying two torches to light up some important moment. These torches were called the Aryan and they reflected Shankadev's belief that even the practice of merely two out of the nine modes of worship was enough. And these two modes of worship that you recommended were Sravana and Kirtana. Kirtan was singing, Sravana was the hearing of it. And he felt that these two modes were adequate to pursue bhakti. In the same fashion, there is a tradition of a single lamp called a mahta or mata, which was used to illustrate a significant segment. Shankadev's belief was forget nine, forget two, even one of the modes of worship was sufficient to stay in the universe of bhakti. So in many ways in the course of the performance, the message of bhakti was symbolically being transmitted as well. Amongst the many macro levels, one of them was the naming of Satriya as the dance. Satriya is a recent nomenclature. What existed earlier was Bhargit, Ankyanat and they were independent dance items. Within the Bhavana, there was Jhumura, there was Natargeet, there was the Pravesar Nach, there was Yuddhar Nach, Nadubhangi and many other dances. Each dance was known by its individual name. Now, when they had to give a name to the style, they could have given very any of the very many names that were in contention. But in 1958, the dance was given the name Satriya by the Borbayan Maniram Datta Mukhtiyar from the Kamlabari Satra in consultation with Dr. Maheshwar Nyog. There was a deliberate reason why they chose Satriya and not Asamiya or any other Shankari which was a name in contention. They chose Satriya because they wanted to assert the bhakti orientation of the dance. In the 1958 seminar, when they were preparing to make a presentation of Satriya's uh, classical features in front of an entire audience invited by the Sangeet Natak Academy for this seminar in Delhi, they felt that Satriya would best represent not just the spirit of the dance form, but the entire range of dances that flourished in the Satras. Admittedly, there remained a discord around the naming even till after the dance received its national recognition in 2000 because some people felt that the, uh, it should be called Sankari from the fact that Sriman Sankadeva's tradition it represents. But then the Satra tradition is far broader than just Sriman Shankadeva. Many changes began to be introduced rather rapidly thereafter. The first was the introduction of girls in the performance that reduced the cross-gender double artistry that is required from male dancers. Secondly, among the adhyapaks that came from the sutras to teach the girls, there was always the doubt about their capacities and so certain basic elements like the training exercise or the matyakaras were dropped. Secondly, less demanding items from the male repertoire were taught so that the male part of the content actually ended up suffering. The process of gender shifts created a problem of costume too, as the costume of the male dancer and the female dancer are, is radically different. 
Here dancers like Garima Hazarika, Indira Pipi Bora, Pushpa Bhuyan and Sharadi Saikya played an important role and used the aesthetics, creativity and experience with other dance forms to employ Assam's rich weaves to create an elegant and ergonomic costume. The reduction of performance repertoire for women outside the satras was offset by certain developments and enrichments that had not happened before. Rasiswar Saikya, while teaching outside of the satras, introduced the mnemonics to which the 64 Matiakharas were to be practiced. Later, a few years after his demise, these Matiakharas were to become an item performed on stage to resemble the acrobatic bandhas of the Akhara Pillars or Gotipua dancers from Odisha. Further, to enrich the Abhinay section, uh, Rasiswar Saikya Borbayan introduced the tradition of doing Abhinay to Bhatimas and then presented it as an item. The first such experiment was to Madhav De's Darashita Sundar Gaura Kalevar. Amongst the musical forms that were available in the satras, two of them were raga oriented. These were the Ankhya Geet and the Bor Geet. In both, the name of the ragas is written on the text. Additionally, in the Ankhya Geet, the Tala is also mentioned. But in the case of the Bar Geets, the singer has the freedom to show creativity and select any Tala or a group of Talas to sing it in. That is because emotion has to reign supreme in a Bar Geet. And the singer has the freedom to choose the Tala that would evoke the emotion. One element of creativity changes and transformations in recent times has been driven by the comparisons with other dancers. Regrettably, Bharat Natyam has captured the imagination of dancers as the most desirable form. Thus, there is an attempt to arrange the garland of items in a margam in much the same manner as in a Bharat Natyam recital, with the word margam also being taken from the Bharat Natyam repertoire, which indicates uh, the structured lineup of items in a concert. But the core of Satriya is different. It is not a dead art form that needs to be laid out in a museum. It is a living and thriving cultural expression and deals with the challenges of a twin life, one sacred and the other secular. It cannot be straight jacketed into a predetermined structure as it has too much variety and too much wealth of different types. I personally feel that no one can do justice to Satra's repertoire in one evening's recital. The performance that I tend to enjoy more than any are the ones that bring the robust sacred and stylized secular on the stage together. But things are not unchanged in the Satras either. Even the monks today have ceased to wear headgear or the shirt and stand there bareheaded and barechested just like the male dancers of Bharat Natyam. While talking about creativity, mention must be made of Narhari Bura Bhagat of the Barpeta Satra, who in the first half of the 20th century created a dance that employed the use of a pair of large symbols in the hands of each dancer. It is danced to the Nagara Nam. Nagara Nam are devotional songs sung to the beat of the Nagaras. The songs are largely taken from the Dasham Skanda of the Bhagavatam and used in a rhythmic composition of Tiyanam that is sung inside the Barpeta Sutra. This rhythmic composition of Tiyanam uses as many as five talas. As it is from the Sutra tradition, its use as part of the repertoire of Satriya is unquestionable. It has grown in popularity and is often the fin finale when we have an ensemble performing. This is an example of creativity within the tradition. In turn, it has generated the second generation of creativity arising from it in the experiments that Menika P.P. Bora, daughter of Indira P.P. Bora, conducted under the guidance of Aswini Kumar Bayan, who had learned the Bhortal Nitra from Narhari Bura Bhagat. They attempted to create pieces in Satriya's repertoire that were performed not to the percussive accompaniment of the coal, but to the percussive accompaniment of the Nagara and Bhortal. 
which have a rather vigorous percussive tradition and stance. Some rather dramatic numbers from the Ankhya Bhavana and Jhumara tradition that are ensemble based lend themselves to recasting as solo pieces. It requires deep knowledge of the text, melody and percussion. It may need the inclusion of select matiakaras and strong abhinay segments. Some such pieces that come to mind are Anvesa Mahanta's Putana and Srijani Mahanta Abhinay uh, to the song written by Srimant Madhavdev, Soi Bone Barmali, arranged in Ragtura Basant, while Anvesa depicted Putana strongly using the lawns amongst the Matiakara to depict Putana's death throes in the Madhavdeva song Srijani after describing the beauty and aesthetic appeal of the landscape where Krishna roams around with the other cow herds and plays haunting melodies on his flute, she introduced the demon stalk Bakasur, his beady eyes close in on Krishna and he closely observes him before attacking and attempting to devour him. But ultimately, Krishna emerges triumphant by slaying the demon. Often in the bhavanas presented in the satras, Bakasur's demonic presence is established via a mask. In fact, satras are known to have Bakasur masks so large that a lineup of young monks playing the role of Krishna's cowherd friends appear to be swallowed up by this avian demon as they enter its cavernous stomach via the beak. But on the dance stage, the same impact is created out of the careful selection of movements for both the demon and for Krishna keeping an eye onto the dramatic choreography. Both dancers were guided by the eminent Satriya scholar and practitioner, the late Dr. Jagannath Mahanta, in creating this piece, Putana by Anvesa Mahanta and Soi Bone Banamali by Srijani Bhaswa Mahanta. The late Dr. Jagannath Mahanta's loss is immense and will be greatly felt as Satriya spreads its wings and pushes its boundaries. Mention must be made about two choreographies done recently by Bhavanan Borbayan of the Uttar Kamlabari Satra. This Bismillah Khan awardee created a dance piece on the environment based on carefully selected excerpts from the sacred texts that describe the beauty of the environment. That in itself was a modernist treatment of the content of Satriya's literature, but more interestingly, was the, f was the forum uh, at which he performed it, an awards function in Mumbai. Even more recently, he choreographed in 2013 a work on the weaving of the Vrindavani Vastra. The Vrindavani Vastra was a fabric woven under the direct supervision of the founder of the Ekasaran Nam Dharam, uh, Sriman Shankadev. Today, only a fragment of the cloth is found in the British Museum. The fabric still exercises great emotional power on the minds and psyches of the followers. Therefore, this piece hit the right emotional chords. It was premiered in Paris, where Satriya enjoys considerable prominence. In a similar vein, the production Devaki Kheravarnam was created. It is evident from the nomenclature itself that it has Bharatnatyam as its inspiration. Uh, and dare I say, as its aspiration as well. The word Varnam is a very carefully and deliberate choice. This is danced often by the Bismillah Khan Awadi Mir Nanda Borthakur, a prime disciple of Sri Jatin Goswami. The piece is based on lyrics written in Sanskrit by Dr. Mukunda Madhav Sharma. They are set to music by Prabhat Sharma, the greatest name in Satriya music today. The poetry compares the state of Assam with Devaki. As Devaki is pained with the loss of her children in the cruelest manner, a loss perpetrated by Kamsa, Asan too has undergone considerable setbacks and disappointments politically. The piece of political lament in the guise of, classical, of a classical item is truly path breaking in its idea. Satriya, supported in the background with its egalitarian philosophy and its anti-establishment theory, has used its artistry to raise social and spiritual concerns. This piece shows that it has the capacity to raise political concerns as well. 
A recent work that uh, I remember well and was quite remarkable was created by a dancer, Shilpika Bordeloy. It was called Majali and very imaginatively reflected the unique, natural and cultural landscape of Majali. It incorporated all the arts of Majali as well as the arts of the Satras of Majali. You know that Majali is the largest riverine island in the world. It's located in the middle of the Brahmaputra and it is the Gar, the center of many Satras. Once upon a time, there were as many as 66 Satras. Today, regrettably, because of erosion and other uh, losses, only 23 Satras remain. Even then, it is probably the largest concentration of Satras in any one limited area. It is a grand cultural scape work, Majali, that Shilpika created and has had a great impact. It's ideally suited for festivals and international showcasing. Finally, it is funding opportunities that often drive creativity. So, during the Tagore anniversary of 150 years, the sesquicentennial anniversary, the Satriya Kendra, which is a non-teaching Kendra of the Sangeet Natak Academy, uh, it's for promoting Satriya. Now, the Satriya Kendra created a dance drama on Tagore's Chandalika choreographed by Jatin Goswami. This is not in the traditional spectrum of Satriya. It was just this unusual opportunity with its funding that allowed it to be created. Now it has been hailed, Chandalika has been hailed as an impressive work. It certainly makes us question just how much of creativity is permitted in a form and in the thematic content of the form especially when one is dealing with what is a living form and where the Satras for five centuries have been the keepers of its core. This they had done by a shared experience, by collective memory and a tradition of senior and peer review called Mahaladya. If we push creativity too hard, we may end up losing the markers of Satriya's core. And uh, if the keepers of its identity themselves are lost, who will be the measure by which Satriya will be evaluated? In that case, just anything could be passed off as Satriya. A tendency that many Satra practitioners are already bemoaning, claiming that what they see is srijnatmak satriya. Srijnatmak means creative. So there is an appropriateness of creativity that is appropriate. I hope you are able to understand the interesting position satriya finds itself in, being a lived tradition in the satras and a living tradition in the secular stage spaces. I understand that we will do some more work on Satriya, but I hope up to now you are with me, you are understanding the flow and that you are learning to appreciate this newest of India's classical dances. Thank you for your attention.